everyone. My name is Ann Charity Hudley. I'm the North Hall Chair in the Linguistics of African America at the University of California, Santa Barbara. My job and my joy in life is to share, describe, and discover the ways in which Black people throughout the world communicate with a focus on education and culture and language and joy. And so I'm gonna share with you about my work today. And my title is Black Languages Matter, Learning the Languages and Language Varieties of the Black Diaspora. We are all currently in a moment of pandemic and protest. And people from all throughout the world have been reaching out to me to ask, what can I do to help make change and make true the idea that Black Lives Matter? And I've been encouraging people who love language, who love linguistics, to really use that interest, that talent, and that joy to help learn more about Black language, Black culture, and the languages and the language varieties of the Black diaspora. And that's what I'm going to do a little bit with you all today. I want to start by sharing and celebrating some of the texts that really have influenced me and my work and really have influenced what I'm gonna share with you today. Those works include Spoken Soul by John Rickford, African American English, A Linguistic Introduction by Lisa Green, Talking and Testifying by Geneva Smitherman, Language in the Inner City by William LeBove, and Black Linguistics by Sinfree McConey, Geneva Smitherman, Arnetha Ball and Arthur Spears. For me, there are three important aspects concerning what we need to know about Black language and Black culture that really frames how I think about this. The first is that we need to know that Black languages and language varieties exist. Sharing information about the varieties and sharing information about the ways in which Black people communicate what languages they speak, how they speak them, how they write them is an important first aspect of what we'll do today. The second is knowing what Black languages and what Black language varieties look like and sound like. And then the third is knowing how Black languages impact the Black experience. The most important concept when we're learning about Black languages and Black language varieties is that language is culture and your language is your black. And so in this way, both your black and your languages are beautiful. I think about culture, not just as artifacts or tools or tangible elements, but how people in a particular group, for me, the black diaspora, have values, symbols, and interpretations and perspectives that distinguish people in the Black diaspora and really share their identity and culture. That's important because it's really important to know that we have multiple varieties and languages within Black languages. The cultures vary from person to person, from place to place. And this really became true to me in my study of pigeons and creoles. We know that pigeons and creoles have a history in the change and varieties of languages as they come into contact with each other as people, particularly from Europe, colonized places and brought enslaved people to them. But what that really did was create a di diaspora that we can trace through the languages, through the language use, the vocabulary, the grammar, the cultural um, ideas that are shared. And that work really was first demonstrated by a scholar named Lorenzo Dow Turner. Lorenzo Dow Turner was an anthropologist and a linguist at Howard University, a historically black college in Washington, DC. Lorenzo Dow Turner traced vocabulary and cultural practices for people in the Sea Islands of South Carolina and Georgia, who speak a Creole called Gullah, to the languages and language varieties of West Africa. 
A particular movie that shows the incredible work of Lorenzo Dow Turner is The Language You Cry In. In the movie, it shows Turner's work tracing what had become a song that was sung by families, particularly by children and mothers in the Sea Islands of Georgia, back to West Africa, where they discovered that it was originally a Mende funeral or burial song. The documentary shows that African-American language and cultural practice was transmitted through communities and changed, but that connection back to Africa was direct and real. And so for me, I wanna encourage all of you to consider studying different languages from the African continent. The first African language that I had an opportunity to study was Gez. That is the classical language of the Christian Ethiopian church. For me, what that allowed me to see was the relationship between languages in East Africa and languages of the Arab diaspora, particularly Hebrew and Arabic, and really helped me understand the relationship between the cultures and languages of Af all of Africa, North Africa, and the Middle East. There are so many languages and varieties in Africa, I won't try to put a number on it, but there are some large language families, the Niger Congo language family, the Nilo Saharan language family, the Khoisan language family, and then the Afro-Asiatic of which Gez is a member. And what is so important of thinking about this is that there are also languages that don't seem to be related to each other. So we need more research and more understanding of how those languages came about, how they're varying and changing today, and what those relationships may be, but we just don't have the information. Pigeons and Creole languages are found throughout the world. Those that I think about associated with Black people are primarily in Africa, in the Caribbean, in Latin and North America, but we can see the process of Creolization throughout how Black people communicate as we combine different languages and different varieties of language with others. Traditionally, Creoles have been described by the European or the colonizing language, but many scholars work to show that it is the contact between languages, between the African languages and the European that makes the Creoles real. So I like to present this in a world map rather than just thinking about it categorically of which languages had contact with English speakers, with French speakers, Spanish, Portuguese, or other languages. That's because the African influence is just as important, if not more important, for those Black speakers as we look at language not just as the grammar or the sounds, but the communication, the discourse, the cultural communicative practices. The study of Black language and culture helps us see that the diaspora is real. So I have found an amazing video by Damsel21 on TikTok, where you'll see a Jamaican speaker and a Nigerian speaker comparing the ways that they pronounce different words. You'll hear some of the ways that the Black diaspora language manifests in these speakers. But what is so fun for me is not just the difference, but the similarity, how they communicate with each other and really understand that full sense of black language variety and culture. Forest, forest, botu, baku, pomegranate, panganate, macaroni, macaroni, vitamins, vitamin, padu, pago, uh uh, military, military, oi, isle. Then how do you say isle? Isle? Plantain, plantain. <laughs> Coconut, coconut, <laughs> neighbor, neighbor, <laughs> tomato, tomato. <laughs> the focus of my work is on African American language and culture in the United States. It is also a diaspora. When Black people originally came to the United States, they were mostly came as enslaved people to the Southeast United States. But particularly after the First and Second World War, large numbers of African-Americans moved from the Southeast United States across the country, taking their language, their culture, and their customs with them. 
So I've been particularly interested in how those different people from different African traditions and backgrounds have come together in the United States, have come in contact with people from all around the world, and how that's influenced not just Black language and culture, but the whole language and culture of the United States and then the world. I consider myself to be part of the Black migration tradition as I grew up in Southeastern United States in Tidewater, Virginia, but now I live in California in what would be considered coastal or Southern California. And I know how my language has changed even um, as I've lived here, but also how I talk differently to Black people in Virginia and how I talk differently to pe Black people in California. We've learned that all languages have value. An important concept for the Black diaspora is that your language is not broken and neither are you. This is really important because in the history of segregation, discrimination, colonialization, the languages that Black people speak have been described as broken or incomplete. And so a lot of this work really helps support the idea that there is no broken English, not for Black people, but really not for anyone. We've learned a lot about how African-American English varies within the Black or African-American English diaspora. So I'm gonna give you some examples of how that works. And one that has had a lot of focus is relates to consonants and how they are either produced or not produced depending on the variety, but also depending on the speaker. And this is known as inherent variation. So how consonants are produced has in, is influenced by if a person is African-American, but also where the consonant is produced in the word. So stir, S-T-I-R, resting, R-E-S-T-I-N-G, and rest may vary because stir at the beginning of the word, the consonant there is S-T, is usually pronoun pronounced stir. So stir, the consonants are at the beginning of the word, S-T or stir is usually pronounced. But resting, where the consonants are in the middle of the word, resting, may sound like resting or resting. And then rest, where the S-T is at the end of the word, may sound like rest, or it may be produced as rest or rest. And it really varies, again, not just by who's speaking, but it could vary in a particular moment. And how does that happen? We know that variation is internal to a language, but also external. The age of a speaker, their gender, sexual orientation, the geographic distribution, where you are in the, in the world, and who you're speaking to varies. And it can vary by if you're speaking to other Black speakers who also use Black varieties of language, if you're speaking to people of different social cultural groups, if you're at home, if you're having fun, or if you're at work, all of that can help influence how you would pronounce the word in a given situation. Something important to know about African-American languages and varieties and Black diasporic languages and varieties is it is important to understand how much of the variety two different communicators actually understand. This concept is known as mutual intelligibility. And for me, it is at the heart of my work. Two people could be speaking English and they would absolutely be um, correct in saying they speak English or a variety of English. But what's important is to understand how much communication is really happening between the two speakers. I study this a lot in educational studies. Historically in the United States, African-Americans have fought hard for their right to education through the history of segregation and discrimination. And that history has also made it such that the majority of teachers in the United States are white. So it's really important, this concept of mutual intelligibility to study how much communication is effective between black students and white teachers in particular. Another concept that's really important is that speakers of different but related varieties of a language can understand each other without much prior support. This is the way that the linguistic Black diaspora became real for me. When I was a first year student at Harvard University, my instructor, who's now a professor at the University of Michigan, Marlies Baptista, 
was teaching pigeons in Creole languages and she started to put some different forms on the board. I was a first year student just getting started in linguistics and as she was speaking and writing, I realized I already understood what she was talking about. And so what it made clear for me is that understanding how these varieties occur is not necessarily just something you would learn in a linguistics or language class, but through your lived linguistic experience. And that gives us the concept is that we can really understand each other to varying degrees. A question that I often get, especially when we know that learning English is important in the world, is why then do languages still vary? Why are there still Creoles? Why do people still communicate using African-American English if learning English is so important? And my argument is that people use their language variety because they want to preserve their meaning. So while we could speak another language or another variety and express ourselves in, in different varieties of English, including standardized English, we preserve meaning and cultural value through our use of African-American language. This concept is key and has really been expressed in linguistic research, but also in a resolution that was passed by the Conference on College Composition and Communication, which is a part of the National Councils of Teachers of English. The resolution states that students have a right to their own language. And this is important, they say, for communicative purposes so that people preserve their meaning, but also that they preserve their humanity, their sense of community, and their dignity as learners. And so uh, what we are working on now is really making sure that that student's right to their own language rings true throughout the Black diaspora. This struggle for linguistic and human rights has been led by people who have been making linguistic and human rights true for people throughout the world. The work of, of leaders, including Martin Luther King and Nelson Mandela, show to us that the language of Black activism is powerful beyond measure. The human rights, the civil rights justice that's been linguistically and rhetorically expressed by Black people has not just brought about rights for Black people, but rights for everyone. And so understanding how Black communication happens gives us an idea on how we can have the linguistic and cultural power to change everything, the entire world. So studying the strategies, studying the practices, studying the ways in which a Black speaker draws an audience in, gives an audience hope, makes change happen, is an important aspect of the study of Black language and culture. The study of Black language and culture has also shown that your Black doesn't have to look or sound like mine. The varieties are rich and real, and they are just now really beginning to be described fully. So I wanna encourage people to listen, learn and share so that the research can really reflect the fact that there is so much inherent, external, social, cultural, and identity variation within the Black diaspora. Documenting and sharing this variation is important beyond interest because it has educational implications. Traditionally, language use, which language you speak and how you speak it, has been incorrectly tied to both intelligence and achievement in school settings. So many scholars, one I wanna highlight now, my colleague, Michelle DeGroff. Michelle is a professor of linguistics at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, also known as MIT. Michelle is from Haiti and speaks Haitian Creole and is working to really ensure that more students in Haiti get a chance to learn in Haitian Creole rather than in the colonizer language French. Michelle has shown that this is so important as students learn in any context but particularly in STEM or science, technology, engineering, and mathematics concepts. As students are doing complicated mathematical technological work, having to translate into French, which is a language that they may not really have even had a chance to learn, impedes the entire learning 
process. So this idea of linguistic discrimination, linguistic equality has direct implications on learners. This information is important in all realms of life. In education, where knowing about black languages and black varieties can help students learn not just STEM, but how to read and how to communicate and be part of an educational community. This information has implications for law and in the legal system as black people interact with police officers, with judges and juries and lawyers and attorneys and making sure that their stories, their communication is understood is an important aspect of work that's going on with respect to African-Americans in particular and the Black Lives Matter movement. Information about language varieties is important for people in the speech and hearing realm as well. Particular linguistic details of how people pronounce their words, what grammatical patterns they use, and how their community practices were prior to strokes, if they have differences and are working on sounding more like their community, is important so that speech and hearing professionals don't make people sound like standardized English varieties or standard other languages that are not their target home community variety. Knowing about black languages and varieties is important as in business. When people apply for jobs, as they work in workplaces and make sure that they have opportunities for the future, being judged on the way that you speak or different ways that you write that are tied to their language and culture can result in economic situations that are undesirable. People may not, black people may not be hired. They may not be given promotions because of the way that they kind of appear or sound to others. And so it's really important for us to advocate for the study of black language, black culture, black varieties, African languages, Caribbean languages, so that human rights, human justice, civil rights can be more directly tied to linguistic justice. And in this way, for me, we will really know that linguistically, culturally, and all the way around, Black Lives Matter. So I'm gonna to stop today and encourage you to start to learn more about black languages, black language varieties. Maybe you've heard something on television or on social media, or you've heard a song, or maybe you had a communication situation with the black person and you didn't quite understand something or you wanna learn more. Now's the time to do that so that you too could be part of this movement for linguistic and social justice. I want to thank a few people now who've been responsible for this work and who have supported the work and who have sponsored this work. I want to thank the National Science Foundation, the University of California, particularly the Historically Black College and University Initiative that has allowed me to do this work not only at UC Santa Barbara, but, in, but at colleges and universities in the United States that have supported Black students and educators and researchers for hundreds of years. I also wanna thank all of my colleagues, my students and participants in the work over time who have really made it real. And I wanna thank all of you for joining me today. And now we'll have some time for questions. And there are so many things from your talk that I want to ask you about, but I'm just going to start with a huge question. How can people decolonize their thinking about the English language? I think one of the important ways that you can decolonize your thinking about the English language is number one, hold fast to that idea that all linguists share, that all languages really are equal. And the way that we actively make them equal is through this process of learning them and learning about the ways in which they change and which, in which they vary over time and the ways in which languages have come into contact. I think it's really important if you wanna take a particular decolonization lens to understand the history of how English became standardized through the process of colonization that that standardization of English that we all kind of now see is important to learn for education, for business, um, and even in social conditions where you wanna really sound um, upper middle class or high class was intentional, it was specific, and it was done alongside a political process of putting particular people in power 
and elevating the ways that they sounded and communicated. And once you kind of really focus in on that intentional process, to me, that's when the real decolonization can come um, into action because we're not taking a given form as standard as being just good or important, um, but as something that was intentionally done to really um, elevate people and subjugate other people. I feel like it's gonna take educational curriculums some time to catch up to this idea that there isn't a correct language and that deviation is bad. So while they wake up to that, how can people teach themselves or their kids from the early years the better ideas? I think one thing that's really important in, for individuals and in families and communities is really start to um, take inventory for yourself of what languages and what language varieties are spoken around you in your local community, um, in your um, own town or area, but also in your own family. And start to think about those people, even in your own family, who you might say, oh, their English isn't that great, or you know, why are they always using some different accent or variety patterns? And, even, and just start there, like start learning about those family members, those community members, um, and set yourself up in those positions as language learners. So really starting to learn those varieties, learn those differences, um, and understand where those came from. That's the same strategy that I actually use um, in my own work. When I go into a school or a community where I'm helping people think about that, I really first get them to think about people that they know and care about that have a language variety. And that empathy, right? People that you know sound different, but that you love and care about. If we extend that, I've actually seen that go a long way, um, particularly when I'm working with educators, because they'll say things like, oh, yeah, you know, I speak this standardized English because I'm a teacher. But my grandmother, you know, she spoke differently. And then we start talking about the grandmother and the experiences that that grandmother may have had um, as an immigrant or as a working class person working in a factory or someone who um, was, you know, for me, a lot of them people, grandparents were working under harsh conditions right after slavery or in Jim Crow. And that humanization process, when you start to really tie that language pattern to that social or cultural situation, that's where I think the change can really um, not just begin, but spread. But there's so much emotionally to work through as well when people have been forced to assimilate in order to try not to be disadvantaged or that they don't even maybe realize that the way they communicate with uh, their families is a real legitimate form of a language and they might not know that it's part of a bigger thing. There are so many forces working against people to validate their own linguistic experiences. Like, what can people do for themselves, I suppose, just psychologically to get away from these harmful forces working against them? I think the biggest thing for me is to legitimize not just learning different languages, but different varieties of language and putting strength forward um, messaging around learning different varieties of, of languages is really being multilingual. Um, so once you empower people to really think about it as different languages, uh, they can start to really think about that as a skill set. Um, and then I have people really start to think about when are you in situations when knowing that other language or that other variety is really prized? Like when you really need to communicate with someone, medical situations, when you're really working with people who are trying to learn and flipping it into something that's a set of skills. I do this in my own classes because my students will come in that same way, speaking different varieties um, of language. And I'll say, okay, now you are the experts. Tell me what I need to know about your variety um, to make sure that we could get this work done in terms of helping communities be stronger. Um, so really flipping that script and putting people as experts, I think is the first step. But for, I think even when I really started to reframe it for myself as multilingualism, and not just some different varieties that I knew or heard when I was growing up. I think that's where that real um, mental shift started to happen. Where do you see the role of the internet and social platforms like TikTok in their role in black language and educating people about it or reinforcing it as real languages? I think the positive aspects have been wonderful, uh, particularly when I think of something that we think of as hashtag black Twitter. Um, has served to be a place where Black people can have their language 
celebrated and, and even validated by others who share the same linguistic or cultural traits. You know, one thing that people have said, especially in the rise of black Twitter, is like, I didn't even know that other people in other places maybe use that pattern or that vocabulary or that cultural practice. And when they got to see how widespread it was on Twitter, it went from something that maybe would have been a family or a community or a race secret into something that is held up in cultural pride. Um, and then the short linguistic examples and bursts that we see on Twitter, oh, sorry, the short examples of linguistics um, examples that we see on TikTok are really amazing for bringing that message home, right? So you hear it and you're like, oh, that sounds like me. That sounds like my cousin or that sounds like my friend down the street. Um, that hasn't been reflected as much in TV, cinema, right? In the news media. And so having everyday people being able to, to document and replicate that information has been amazing. I mean, there's always going to be a negative side to things like that as well um, in terms of denigrating language or having bad messages also be able to be shared and rarefied. Um, but for, for I think a lot of people, the, the good has been outweighed. I mean, even when you think about that, when we have a negative cultural situation, Black Twitter will get on it and start making comments and share that um, sense of resilience that people have had about their language, their culture and experience um, that I found personally empowering when I'm on Twitter. Um, but I think many of my students are really starting to, sh to study that, not just for the linguistic significance, but for that cultural empowerment significance as well. I was wondering as well whether one of the other negatives might be because it's spread beyond the in-group of the language that you've got people using it who maybe should know that they are not supposed to be using it. Absolutely. And there's just, you know, huge, uns I would say, unsolvable debates in some aspects, but then very blatant cases of, you know, when is it language contact and then when is it language appropriation? And anyone you ask, even linguists, they're going to have different opinions about what's appropriation and what's contact and language, you know, change. Um, but I would say to me, I think of contact as when people are in a sense of discovery, admiration and empowerment. And appropriation happens more when you have situations where people are profiting without sharing the history of the language and culture um, and also using it in mocking ways. Um, so, you know, when you're trying to get a laugh, when you're using someone else's culture, um, often for financial profit or popularity online uh, versus trying to really actually interact in online um, and physical spaces uh, with the people whose language variety you're attempting to use. You mentioned um, about language in the legal system. I was just wondering if you could talk a little more about that, because that seems like a, a huge area that really needs examining. So this is, there's been a lot of strong recent work um, in the legal system to show the challenges that Black people have interacting with individual police officers, right, in their homes and communities, with lawyers when they're trying to tell their story about what happened or share their defense um, or also share, you know, their allegations, um, and also in their interactions with judges, in their interactions when they are incarcerated with um, the prison penal system workers, um, and showing that if you don't know the variety of language there, the interactions can be negative. So the police would be more um, likely to react based on the race, the visual racism, like how you look as a black person, but also the interaction, the speech, the speaking. Um, and then also in the legal system, being able to really give your account of what happens, that has been misinterpreted both by attorneys, juries, and um, judges, and also um, been doc have, there's been challenges with document docu there's been challenges with documentation um, by the court recorders. So this is a situation where the FBI um, and other police off police agencies have reached out to linguists, including me and others, um, to make sure that communication is happening. And so I argue this is a place where people who speak African-American English or other varieties of Black English are necessary and vital um, to make sure that justice happens throughout the legal system. What did you think when you got the call from the FBI? <laughs> they were recruiting. Them. They have an active recruitment looking for people who speak a varieties of Black English. And this includes African-American English, but also Creole varieties, people who um, have you know diasporic aspects to make sure that everything from when they're listening um, to people to um, making sure that justice is being served, that that communication is accurate and authentic. 
So I always, you know, looked out in terms of if students were interested in that as being something that is important to do. Um, I've worked myself on helping people, you know, look at documents or look at um, testimony and make, making sure that it's accurate. And I found a lot of Black linguists are, are doing that work right now. Um, it's something that they really uh, feel strongly about as part of the Black Lives Matter movement. And it's so fascinating to hear about your work. Thank you so much for sharing with us today. Thank you so much.